To be quite honest, I wouldn't mind living in a rom-com. Everything is brighter, Holland Notes is playing every five minutes, my hair would always be perfect, I'd never have to do it, wash days would be a thing of the past, I would have a great, well-paying job and I'd never have to actually work. I'd just sit in my office for some scenes but otherwise I'd be as free as a bird. I'd have an amazing sweater collection and a beautiful apartment and also it, the person of my dreams or whatever. It's easy to dunk on rom-coms, to point out all the conventions of the genre and make fun of how predictable they can be, but rom-coms are fucking awesome. You know how I feel after I've watched a good rom-com? I feel the joy I get after I've listened to Curtis Mayfield's Move On Up but like turn to 11. I feel like dancing. I can't fucking dance but after a good rom-com, I don't give a shit. And you killed them. Yes, you, you murderer. <laughs> This isn't about the death of rom-coms, I just get sour sometimes. However, even as someone who enjoys rom-coms, I can't deny or ignore, nor do I want to, all the icky stuff. Plot devices and characters in many romance films throughout the years romanticize behaviors that, in the real world, are just plain wrong. The entire plot of the 1998 comedy There's Something About Mary hinges on the main character, played by Ben Stiller, hiring a private investigator to track down his high school crush. And this means war, two agents enamored by the same woman break into her house to find out her interests so they can impress her whilst on a date. I'll admit the direction in this scene is something I find very amusing, but it, it's it's fucked up. It's very fucked up, It's and it's very weird. Throughout this movie, they even listen to her phone calls and watch her every move. Your Honor, this is some bullshit right here. And these are just the more extreme examples, but we see this kind of stuff on smaller scales in virtually every rom-com. From Noah threatening to kill himself if Allie doesn't go on a date with him in the notebook. Why not? I don't know, because I don't want to. Noah! Alright, well you leave me no other choice then. Oh my god! To the fucking princess switch. The art of love is largely the art of persistence. No the fuck it's not, Albert. Just as it's easy to dismiss the rom-com genre on the basis of their perceived unimportance, it's also easy to dismiss the notion, nay, the truth, that movies have an impact on real life, on real people. Here's a quote from our friend Julie Beck at The Atlantic. Reasonable people know that rom-coms aren't what love is really like, just as reasonable people know that porn is not what sex is really like, but these movies still create an image of romance that leaks into the atmosphere and may subtly shape people's perceptions and expectations of love. Julie Littman's study, I did it because I never stopped loving you, is all about this, how romance movies frame these disturbing behaviors as evidence of true, passionate love, how persistence in the pursuit of love is a good thing. And if someone says no, it really just means that you should try it again and again and again until in the movie world they fall for you or until in the real world they're so afraid of you that they figure saying yes might make things easier on them and you have a relationship built entirely on fear and distrust. Happy Valentine's Day. And it's not that these instances of repugnant behavior exist on screen, it's that they exist within the context that the extreme actions taken are okay. It's not okay, and it's being framed as okay, and that really makes it not okay. People notice these cliches, these tropes, whatever you want to call them, and rightfully call them out. Movies my generation grew up loving are often revisited now in our adult years for us to marvel at and go, huh, that was kind of fucked up, I never noticed. Like Edward and Bella, sure, a lot of people love it, again, right now, but it's still weird. Why the fuck are you watching me sleep, Edward? I don't even know you. Stop breaking into my room and go get some 100-year-old vampire snatch already. Many of these movies are guilty for the crime they are being accused of, romanticizing unhealthy relationships, normalizing abusive tendencies, but there's a movie that I find too often gets brought up in the same vein that I personally believe is innocent. Your Honor, Exhibit A. My Best Friend's Wedding is a 1997 romantic comedy that stars Julia Roberts, Cameron Diaz, Rupert Everett, and Dermot Mulroney. It was nominated for an Academy Award. My name's Newton Howard for my 
movie. Okay, fine. It was for music, but it was still nominated. In the years since the movie's initial release, a lot of think pieces about it have popped up on the internet, from independent bloggers to staff writers for Vice magazine. It's been deemed by some an inappropriate movie that isn't even remotely romantic and has a protagonist who does horrible things, which is partly true. And it's been deemed by others an ingenious subversion of romance tropes that's smarter than it gets credit for, which is also true. Your Honor, if I could just tell the jury about my best friend's wedding before we get to the alleged crime. This is a story about a woman, Julianne, whose best friend is getting married. Specifically, the best friend that she used to date and who made her vow that if they weren't both married by 28, they'd marry each other. A friend who she loves dearly. She doesn't realize how dearly or how passionately, though, until she finds out that he's getting married to someone else. The best friend, Michael, is marrying the much younger and much more naive Kimmy. He's a sports writer who travels a lot for his job, and Kimmy is a college student who comes from a very affluent family. She should be the type of person that Michael hates. Rich people. The elite. But she's endearing and funny and warm, and he's in love. But Michael is still nervous about the wedding, so he asks Julianne to come down for the event and support him through it. She's basically his best man. But Julianne has ulterior motives. Michael loved her at one point, and at the news that he's getting married, she's just full of jealousy and rage. I've got exactly four days to break up a wedding, steal the bride's fella, and I haven't one clue how to do it. He adored me for nine goddamn years. Me! <laughs> I can see why. It seems to her that there's still a spark between her and Michael, so she plans to break up the happy couple just days before their wedding. And that's the entire movie. Julianne scheming and planning and trying to win back the love of her life, and it's not exactly unrequited. At one point, Michael did love Julianne, and he holds the memories he has of her dear. Even Kimmy knows this. He's got you on a pedestal. And me in his arms. Julianne tries everything. Early on, Kimmy confides in her that although Michael loves karaoke, she could never do it because she can't carry a tune. So Julianne tries to embarrass her by making her sing at karaoke, but she's so bad and she doesn't care that everyone, Julianne included, just can't help but root for her. Kimmy's parents are wealthy, so Julianne plants the seed in Michael's mind that Kimmy might make him get a job with her father so that they wouldn't have to travel all the time. And he hates this, but he denies that she would ever do that. So then, naturally, Julianne convinces Kimmy that Michael really does want a job with her father and tries to get Kimmy to set it up, which leads to an argument between them, but still does not break them up. Julianne's friend and agent, George, who she's been confiding in the entire time and who is her only voice of reason, visits her so that she can have support when she finally tells Michael that that she still loves him instead of just trying to sabotage everything. And Julianne tells everyone he's her fiance. To make Michael jealous, girl, the hole you are digging right now. Eventually, George leaves and makes Julianne promise that she will tell the truth. And she still doesn't. She sends an email to Michael's boss from Kimmy's father's address. An email that basically says, Michael loves his job. Please fire him so he can work with me and be good enough for my daughter. I know how awful it sounds. It sounds awful because it is awful. Thankfully, Michael doesn't lose his job, but his boss does send him the email he received. I can't believe I'm doing this to you on the night before your wedding, but I think you need and deserve to know what you're marrying into. The wedding is called off the night before the ceremony, but somehow Kimmy and Michael still persevere. They talk it out through Julianne and forgive each other and decide to get married anyway. Julianne has no tricks left and no time, so she confesses her feelings at last. Michael, I love you. And she kisses Michael. Kimmy sees it and she starts running and then Michael's running after Kimmy and Julianne is running after Michael. Now, everything I've just said is horrendous. If you love someone, you don't do that to them. You don't manipulate them into loving you back or lie and scheme your way into a relationship. In this chase scene, there's a quote that reaffirms everything that up until this point was still quite obvious. George, this is all your fault. I, I, I told him the truth. I said that I loved him and I kissed him and this is what's happened. Jules, a question. When you kissed Michael, did he kiss you back? That's beside the point. We were interrupted. Who interrupted you? Kimmy! She ruined everything, and Michael started chasing her before he could answer me. Michael's chasing Kimmy. Yes. You're chasing Michael. Yes. Who's chasing you? If it's not clear, I like this movie a lot. I, I kind of love it. And this quote is my favorite thing about it. 
Everything up to this point has never been framed as being okay. It's never been suggested that we root for Julianne or that anything she's doing is alright because she's doing it for love after all. There are moments between her and Michael where they reminisce on their past love affair, dance to their song, and even in these moments the mood is sad. You never feel that Julianne is getting what she wants or that she even deserves it. You're feeling that she's chasing after something that's already gone, that she can't get back. In the scene where they dance to their first song, she starts crying, unbeknownst to Michael. She knows she's lost him before this moment, but she keeps trying. Does she keep trying because that's what love is? Because that's what the world has been conditioned to believe love is? That it's not taking no for an answer? It isn't until this moment that she lets it sink in. Who's chasing you? Nobody. Get it? There's your answer, Kimmy. No! Yes! Jules, you are not the one! And for God's sake, the wedding is at 6 p.m. You have a small but distinct window of opportunity to do the right thing. Movies, music, and romance novels can perpetuate the myth that if you love someone, you never give up on being with them. That you follow them to the ends of the earth and back because if you believe you're meant to be together, then you're meant to be together. Fuck what they have to say. It's a sentiment given as inspirational advice, as motivation. Besides it being creepy, it's nonsensical. Just because you've fallen in love with someone doesn't mean someone has fallen in love with you. Who's chasing you? No one. Take the lyrics to Death Cab for Cutie's I Will Possess Your Heart. It's a song about a guy who just won't take the hint. The girl he likes is clearly not into him and has probably turned him down a million times, but he just won't give up. And like with other romance movies, we've heard the sentiment before, but under a veneer of goodness. When put under a different light, you can see it for how wrong it is. The lyrics read, How I wish you could see the potential. The potential of you and me. It's like a book elegantly bound, but in a language that you can't read just yet. You gotta spend some time, love. You gotta spend some time with me. And I know that you'll find love. I will possess your heart. Babes and booze of the jury, my best friend's wedding is I will possess your heart. Both are subversions of the cliche, the art of love is the art of persistence cliche. Although the movie is a lot more lighthearted and actually does deserve to be a comedy. Whereas the song is, well, to quote Ben Gipper, the lead vocalist of Death Cab for Cutie, the song is basically about a stalker. It's about this nice guy who wants this girl he can't have and he believes they'll be together once she realizes how great he is. He just has to wait it out. That's the part that makes the song really creepy. The delusion of thinking they were meant to be together. Every action Julianne takes is framed negatively, where other characters and their stalking and invasion of privacy is either comedic or heartwarming because it really shows the distance they're willing to go for love. Julianne is sort of a villain. You cringe every time she does something awful you want her to stop. The music doesn't swell like it does in some movies where kissing someone without their consent is romantic. Why? Who? <sighs> Not today. You see with every bad decision how much Kimmy and Michael love each other and how much Julianne is just in complete denial. And all throughout it, George is constantly telling her, hey, sweetie, get your head out of your ass. That's what was refreshing about this film in 1997 and today. It takes the habits we've seen romanticized in so many films and frames it in a way that reminds you of its indecency. It's not okay, and it's being framed as not okay, which makes it okay. I'm the bad guy. Framing is everything. I see my best friend's wedding swept into this category a lot. This category of romance comedies that are actually, oh my goodness, really wrong and um, toxic. I got through this video so long without saying that fucking word. And each time I see it, it reminds me of a few years back when someone wrote an opinion piece in which the gist was, actually, Michael Scott is problematic. And you're kind of just like, no shit, Sherlock. That's the fucking point. What are you gonna say next? It's always sunny is offensive? Uh, I would be a bear. No, no, see, I don't think you'd be a bear either. As a matter of fact, I don't know what you would be because you're definitely not a twink. When the movie ends, Julianne confesses her feelings to Michael and tells him all the things she's done to break them up. He's outraged, but Julianne makes it clear that she understands she fucked up. Michael, I was just trying to... to win you to win you back, but that doesn't excuse any of it. I'm pawn scum. Well, lower actually, I'm, I'm like the, the fungus that feeds on pawn scum. Lower. And now she just wants to get the two of them to get back together and get married. 
She volunteers to look for Kimmy, who she finds in a communal bathroom, and it leads to a scene that I never fail to get a kick out of. It ends with Kimmy and Michael getting married, with Julianne alone at the ceremony until George returns to comfort her and remind her that despite her heart being broken, she did the right thing. The ending could have broken everything up until this point apart completely. Case in point, the original ending saw Julianne meeting a handsome stranger at the ceremony who would have swept her off her feet. Who was this handsome stranger? John Corbett. But this ending didn't test well with audiences who, A, were confused because everything up until that point seemed to guarantee that Julianne would not be rewarded for her actions, and B, just really didn't think she needed to be with anyone after all of that. I know I just said everything about how the framing of the film makes an ending where Julianne is rewarded with love inappropriate and confusing, but I do have to say, I detect a grain of sexism with the vitriolic reaction to Julianne overall. Anyway, they made this ending instead, and this is what keeps it all together. She doesn't have love right now. You don't get love for scheming, but she'll heal and mature and grow and maybe one day she'll fall for someone who'll fall for her. But until then, at least she has a good friend on her side. What the hell? Life goes on. Maybe there won't be marriage. Maybe there won't be sex. But by God, don't sing. Again, Your Honor, Julianne is not an example of what you should do. Her efforts do not lead to her finding true love. Her manipulation tactics and lies only hurt everyone around her. Therefore, I implore the jury of booze and babes not to sentence a romantic comedy that subverts the trope of persistence to death. Thank you. There's lots of things you could fuss about. Maybe Kimmy and Michael don't need to be together. She's young and she wants to finish school and she should finish school. But if there's anything that's not wrong with this movie, it's its fucked up nature and its ability to embrace an unlikable protagonist. Also, this scene, I say a little prayer, it's fucking iconic. <laughs>